Um, so, kind of in, in my mind, I have a number of things I plan to talk about for today. Um, but it's very good if it kind of goes organically with questions and with things that come up. And um, I was thinking to do more of these in the future. So on this particular one, I wasn't thinking to be very site specific with Tiger. Right? Everyone here has flown Tiger quite a bit. Um, and we can talk about cross country from Tiger at another date. But first I wanted to talk about um, some very, they sound basic, but I think they're good concepts and somewhat advanced in, in ways too. Um, concepts about um, glider control and communication and then kind of lead that into thermal, right? Because ultimately when we are thermally, um, we're really kind of feeling the air that we're in. And I like to think of it like a bird feels the wind with its feathers, right? The amazing thing we have with a soft aircraft, with a paraglider, is that it moves and stuff with different wind. When we're going through different air masses, it moves and it gives us that movement down through the harness, through the brakes, through all this stuff. So we're literally feeling the air like a bird with its feathers, and we want to be in the best place to feel that air and try to take it, um, try to use that communication, that data in the best way we can, right? Um, so first of all, one place where I see um, some people making mistakes is how much brake they have on, right? So if we are turning in lift, right? And when do you guys usually turn if, you, uh, if you're trying to thermal? So when do you decide to do a 360? Depends on lift, right? Maybe a few seconds into lift. Yeah, yeah, it's a pretty good rule and one we've probably heard, right? You want to be going up for three seconds before you decide to put the 360 in, because any danger in, well, the, the detraction of turning is it increases our sink rate, right? Anytime we turn, we go down faster, right? So if we turn at a second and a half or two seconds and then we fall out of this thermal, we're actually going down faster than if we had flown through that, that air going straight, and we're not, we're not exploring more air, right? So if we turn it two seconds, fall out of the thermal, come back around at a lower altitude, we've just wasted our searching potential, right? Being in the same place. So three seconds is a great rule, right? If we go through lift for three seconds, we might think it's big enough to fit a 360 in it and go up with that 360. Does that make sense? Cool. So when I do decide to turn, I have three rules to tell me which way to turn, okay? The first rule is pretty obvious, right? If there's a mountain there, I'm not gonna turn into the mountain, right? I don't want, I, I don't want to be in a thermic environment when we're flying thermals, we can assume there's gonna be turbulence, we can assume there's a possibility of deflations and collapses, right? Flying thermals, that's that's what thermals are, up air, down air, turbulence in between. Um, so I don't want any part of my 360 to be less than 400 feet over the ground. Right? That's a pretty good buffer zone to give you altitude to deal with things. Turns out the thermals within 400 feet of the ground are rarely very good anyway. Right? We want to be a little bit higher. We'll talk about that in a little bit. So if the ground's nearby, if the mountain's all on my right, and it's an issue, it's close enough to be an issue, I'm going to turn left. Right? First rule of which way to turn. And if that's the case, I'm going to feel totally fine with doing figure eights up against the mountain. Right? If I'm the mountain, figure eights like this. Right? Because we know anytime I'm facing the mountain, if I get in sync and it's a little, there's more tailwind than I suspected, I'm getting in that 400 foot buffer zone. Does that make sense? So figure eight is fine. One really good rule I was taught when I was, when I was new to paragliding was every 360 starts with a figure eight, right? So if you're looking at it over your shoulder thinking you're doing a 360 and the mountain looks a little bit close, hey, take it into a figure eight, right? No need to screw with that mountain. And if we watch hawks, eagles, vultures, anytime they're near a mountain thermally, they're doing figure eights, right? They'll do figure eights plenty. Even when they're high, they'll do figure eights plenty, right? So, so the experts show us figure eights work just fine. First rule, right? Terrain. If terrain is near us, we turn that way. And obviously, this is, all these things are if we get to decide turn direction. If someone else is in the thermal, what do we do? Circle with them. Circle with them. Same direction, right? As the people in the thermal or even a nearby thermal, right? Same direction. Um, cool. Second is if I feel asymmetric, we're going to talk a lot about these feelings today. If I feel asymmetric motions in my glider telling me about where the thermal is, okay? A couple things I might feel, 
every bladder is different, every pilot is different, but a couple things I might feel before I get to the thermal, I might feel it kind of tugging me towards it, right? And who's felt that before, right? The glider kind of pitches forward a little bit, and if, if the thermal is tugging me to one side or another, it might kind of like pull that way a little bit, right? So if I'm feeling that, that's telling me, oh, okay, look, the, the thermal's a little bit over here on my right. So I'll kind of let the glider take me over there a little bit. Then there's this other feeling once we hit the edge of that lift, right? And that feeling is more like a rising feeling. And if it's asymmetric, let's say it's on the right again, I'll actually feel the right side of my harness pushing more against me, right? I'll actually feel more, more brake pressure on the right side of my glider. And the right side of my glider will be going up more in that lift. Right? So that's, those are the kind of like, like two different asymmetric things. It's a little interesting, right? Because in the first one, when your glider's getting sucked towards the thermal, the right side might go lower, right? But then when you're hitting the thermal, the right side might go higher. The difference is that pitch, right? That's the difference to be cued in on. When we go to brake, how we're feeling the brakes is gonna have a lot to do with that. So we'll get back to that. So that's the, that's the second thing. If, if all those cues were telling me the thermal's on my right and the ground's not an issue, I'm going to turn right, right? I'm going to think, okay, the thermal's over there and I want to turn in that direction. Um, so if the ground's not an issue and all the, everything I'm feeling is very symmetric, not one side or another, right? Then the third rule is upwind, okay? We want to turn into the wind. Why do you guys think we might want to turn into the wind? The strongest core. The strongest core. Really good point, right? This, the part of the thermal that's punching up more vertically, that has more vertical lift, is going to stand into the wind more, right? So it's going to trend to the upwind side of thermals. Does that make sense? Um, the other side of the thermal... Put the whiteboard down. Uh, it's, not, it's not functional. <laughs> Okay, whiteboard's coming. So, um, so upwind side because the stronger core might be there, and because that's the side that's um, has the least penalty for falling out. Cool. So I'll, I'll do this with my whiteboard. Um, so, so like we, like we talked about, the strongest core is going to stand up into the wind the most, right? Let's say the wind's coming from this way. What that means is this side of the thermal, the upwind side of the thermal, is going to, I'm, I'm turning it now so you guys can all see, is going to be a very clear edge of not lift and lift, right? Very easy for a mental mapping, right? Thermal is all about mentally mapping, trying to place yourself in this rolling, rising column of air without references near us, right? It, it, it's a really hard course in like creating this map in your mind. So this edge, the upward edge, is typically the really defined edge. It's very easy to fall out of this side and say, oh, the thermal's right behind me. This edge, imagine this wind coming around the thermal, these bubbles, I call them sucker shards, bubbling off the thermal, right? We'll talk more about soccer bubbles in a little bit. Um, and turbulence back here, right? Because all of a sudden, in a lot of wind, this starts to act like an object in the wind. So the wind's kind of rolling around and going like this, right? So entering a thermal from the downward edge, hey, we have to do it plenty almost every time we launch the first thermal we're entering downward edge, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> is a lot harder to figure out where that edge is than entering upwind edge. So if we have the option, this is the side of the thermal that's a better side to play with, that's a better side to fall out, right? This side's super hard for our mental mapping. It's a jumbled mess in there. Can you guys kind of visualize that a little bit, right? And in general today, I'm gonna to be talking about thermals um, with, with kind of organized principles, which is a very an easier way for us to conceptualize them, but probably thermals are kind of more like a lava lamp where they're always changing and like hundreds of thermals might become one thermal a few thousand feet high and stuff like that, right? So know that we're somewhat simplifying the whole, the whole, the whole way thermals are. Cool. So three rules. What are the three rules? The first one? The terrain. The terrain, right? Don't, don't hit the hill. It's a good rule. Um, second rule? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Follow the flow, right? Kind of. Yeah, exactly. What, what is the thermal telling you in your glider? Where are you going? And the thermal? 
against the wind. Against the yeah, exactly into the wind. And the other reason into the wind is, hey guys, we can lose our objective real fast if every single thermal we're drifting further away from it, right? For instance, you guys know what it's like to land here when it's windy, right? If it's windy from the north, you don't want to go that too far that way, right? All of a sudden, it's really hard to get back this way. So, in general, in cross country or in, in flying in general, if your objective is not downwind, you want to go downwind as little as possible. Sometimes our objective is downwind and then it's all good, but if your objective is crosswind or upwind, you don't want to turn downwind very often at all. So, so you're wanting to turn up one so that if you pop out of it, when you come back around, you're entering it on the upwind side. You're re, you're re Yeah, let, let, me, let me help visualize that just a little bit here, right? So thank you guys for getting the whiteboard right here. Um, so this is the thermal right here, right? This is the upwind edge of the thermal. We're going to say it's, it's pretty... Can you guys see over there? If we have to move a little bit or whatever. We're going we're to say it's predefined, right? Because once again, here's the wind, here's that vertical lift, right? They're interacting like that, right? As we get later in the thermal here, here on the downwind edge of the thermal, this downwind edge of the thermal, right? We're going to have kind of the side of this thermal, we're going to have these bubbles leaving the thermal. Right? You can imagine that wind kind of pushing bubbles off the side of the thermal as we go down. We're going to have turbulence back here just from the wind going around the thermal and swirling around. Um, we're going to have the weaker part of the thermal here in general. right? So if you do follow this edge, it's going to be really hard to get back into it. right? Because for your mental mapping, on top of that, right? let's pretend for a second that this edge was consolidated, which it very rarely is. Sometimes it might be, but very rarely. Look how our glide ratio interacts with this edge if we fall out of it, right? The lower we get, and we're always getting lower on a paraglider, right? We're always going down through the air, right? No matter what, the air has to be going up, but we're still going down through it, even if we're rising in altitude. So as we get closer to the thermal, it's getting further and further away from us when we come in on this edge. Does that make sense? Look at this. As we get closer, as we get lower, closer to the thermal, it's getting closer to us on this edge. Isn't that rad? Right? Look at that. It gets closer and closer and closer right? as we go down. So this edge, for, there, there's a multiple of reasons. One is this glide ratio interaction. A really big one also is the mental mapping, having a defined edge. And then also, we want to trend a little bit upwind unless our objective is straight downwind. All makes sense? Does that kind of answer your question a little bit? Yes. Yeah, cool. So, um, let's talk a little bit about once we do make that 360. Um, so just for clarification too, so if you were flying into the headwind, or you know, taking off and flying into the headwind, and so if you were to go through it, you count your three seconds, you're on the tail side of it now, aren't you? So then, so almost always when we're launching, I think I think that this is your question. So let, let, let's go for it. Um, almost always when we're launching, we're launching into the wind, mm -hmm. right? We like to launch from mountains where the wind's coming up the mountain. So our first thermals, we're typically finding on the downwind side, mm -hmm. right? Right. From here, usually, usually there's uh, the thermal out on the point over here, right? If if it's north wind, we're kind of approaching side windy downwind from it, right? Or we're coming to this thermal that's on the ridge that comes up from landing. Right, and similar thing there. We're, we're approaching it side wind up, you know, yeah. down. But basically, when we take off from most mountain sites, our first thermal we're getting on the downwind side. So more than three seconds is fine, right? What we wouldn't want to do is turn too early, right? And how many times have people thought they were in two and a half, three seconds of lift, turned, and then there's no lift there anymore, Hello. right? Yeah, all the time, right? That's a sucker bubble, right? That's one of these bubbles that have sheared off the thermal, it is rising. It is a rising bubble, but it's not a column. Right? It's this rising bubble, and you can do a circle, and sometimes you even get two, and you can be like, man, damn sure I didn't change the shape of the circle, I'm still in the lift, I'm feeling it well, and I just fell at the bottom. Remember, we're going down through thermals at like, in a straight line, 240 feet a minute, in a circle, you know, most of our turning radius is probably more like 300 feet a minute, we're going down. So 
if it's a bubble, like we get to the bottom of it pretty quick. Or even a column eventually has a bottom. Every thermal eventually ends. So we're, we are going down through the air in the thermal. So if you know those sucker bubbles are from turning too early. You have a thermal here, you go, oh cool, I'm going up. You do a circle and then you fall out of it. You can't find it again. And now you've got to interact with this, yes. mm -hmm. right? We've all felt that, right? And typically there's some sink and turbulence right here, mm -hmm. right? So you're, you're trying to push against sink and turbulence and the, you know, the, the further you go to try to get the thermal, the further away from you it is. And that's the way I roll. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> so how do we decide, right? Is the sucker bubble or is it just the, the right? Great question. So first of all, when you tr try to think, am I entering the downwind or upwind side of this thermal, right? Mm -hmm. If it's the upwind side, no need, right? So if it's, this is the thermal again, right? So if it's this side, no need to wait for any longer than three seconds. Three seconds is enough. Sometimes two and a half might be okay on this side. Because once again, if we fall out, it's pretty easy to just keep our turn going, know where the thermal is, know how to get right back into it, right? And there's not much penalty of falling out on this side. It's not so bad, right? And there's not sucker bubbles on this side, right? The sucker bubbles get drifted off that way. It's smooth. It's more um, organized air. <laughs> this edge can be plenty not smooth, <laughs> but it's more organized. We we should like we get one kind of checked that type thing. Um, <laughs> it's totally smooth air. It's gonna be so nice. <laughs> um, I lost track real quick. Um, yeah, so. Those sucker bubbles are, are one thing we really want to avoid. What I was saying is if we enter this side, two and a half seconds might be okay. Three seconds is, is enough. Yeah. But if we enter this side, mm -hmm. which remember the first thermal of the day we often are, and try to get a mental picture of which side of the thermal you're entering, right, based on the wind. If we enter this side, there's nothing wrong with waiting five seconds, six seconds, mm -hmm. seven seconds, right? Mm -hmm. Flying all the way through the thermal and falling out of this side, mm -hmm. not much penalty. Because yeah. you just yeah. map the whole thing. Yeah. yeah. And likely you feel the most lift right here, right before you fall out. Mm -hmm. So it gives you a really nice map. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah. 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 It could take longer to turn. Yeah. yeah. And how many times have you guys seen here at Tiger <laughs> some pilots just barely staying up against the trees yeah, yeah. and then pilots going out front yeah, and getting the ones that take them to cloud base? Right. right. right? It's a pretty common thing. Right? Because we'll, we'll go into that a little more, but you know, these thermals that really want to go vertically hard aren't the ones that are just rolling up right next to the tree line. Mm. Right? The ones that really want to go vertically hard are going vertically hard. Yeah. Right? They're cracking off from the ground, you know, and, and you, you can find them much higher. And if you think about the kind of usable lift right next to the trees, sure you, a lot of times you can you can like kind of stay up there for hours, but to actually get up and out you need more consolidated air, right? You, you need a bigger air mass of air that's rising. So often that will be a little bit up front, right? It's not yeah. unusual for pilots to like kind of be on the trees until they see a bird or another pilot climbing out front. And then really the climb out often happens a little out front or it could happen you ride the trees and then like from the point above it, it's going off, but still a little bit higher, right? Um, cool. So, <clears throat> We, we've kind of decided when to turn, right? We know if we're entering the downwind side, we're going to wait a little bit longer. One more thing about that real quick. Um, another cue for me that I shouldn't turn wait, yet. Sorry, forgive yeah. me. Just wait a little bit longer, or even, like you said, go all the way through and map it out first. Or even go all the way through, yeah. It's, I mean, it's not like I go all the way through every single time. Mm -hmm. There's not much penalty to that. There's a lot of penalty to turning too early, right? We've all felt the start of bubbles. Mm -hmm. right? Where you're, you're sure you just blew through three or four seconds of lift. And then you do a turn and like, it's not there anymore, right? That, yeah, so we've all felt that. Um, so, wait, we, we might, okay, so if I am entering the downwind side of the thermal, right, one cue that I'll keep going further forward, right, is if I actually feel it within the thermal, my glider getting sucked forward. Remember, we talked a little bit ago about that feeling of the, your glider getting sucked towards the thermal. That same thing can happen within a thermal if there's a better core ahead of you, right? Yeah. What, what are actually the physics of that? I don't know, I like to think the thermal sucker me in. But <laughs> I think there's physics of the air rising maybe having some suction, and then I think also, 
So let's, let's go away from the physics side of things. <laughs> <laughs> but you guys know the feeling, right? My thermal's kind of drawing me into that thermal. Sometimes within a thermal, you'll feel that, and that's telling me like, okay, okay, I'm not there yet, I'm not there yet, I'm not there yet, and then usually you'll get a better climb rate, and your thermal, your glider will stop drawing and come overhead. That's the, your turn. Does that make sense? Cool. So then the turn, right? <clears throat> we, when we turn, obviously we look, we lean, we use some brake, we turn. We want to use our weight shift in, in these gliders a lot, right? Brakes are fine. We have to use brakes a certain amount. We all use, learn to fly with brakes. But if, if you are staying absolutely weight shift neutral and only using your brakes, you're going to be less efficient gliding, climbing, many things than pilots around you who, are, who have that glider connected to their hips, right? Think of the glider as like a kayak, right? If I want to put my weight on that side of the glider, I can't. If I want to put my weight on that side of the glider, I can, right? I can use my hips to decide where my weight is on the glider and get communication back through the glider with my hips, okay? Um, if you imagine what brakes do, let's go this way. Brakes cause drag in the back of the glider, right? You guys can all see that, right? Brakes are, are basically drag in the back of the drag glider. Is, is drag good for aerodynamic efficiency? No, it's not, right? We have to have a certain amount of brake on to have communication with the glider, right? That tells us if the glider's above our head, right? Basically, if we have this tiny little scoop in the back of the glider and the glider starts to shoot forward, there's less pressure on that scoop, right? We feel less pressure through our hands. Our hands come down until they feel the pressure again, effectively stopping that shoot. And as the glider comes back overhead, once again, the pressure will increase. Our hands will come back up to keep that two pounds of pressure, communication pressure, right? That's what we're doing following that communication pressure. We're feeling how much pressure is on that scoop in the back of the glider and keeping the glider overhead. So we have to have communication pressure, right? Otherwise, we have collapses all over the place. It's not so fun, it's well, not in control. Seat, if you put your hands on the seat, it rises. Great question, can we get to it in a little bit? Remind me in case I forget. Let, let's talk through breaks and then and then get to see. It's, it's a very good question. Um, um, so we need communication pressure, but you don't need, if you're flying a straight line and you're just trying to communicate with the glider, you don't need more than communication pressure. And in fact, I'd say our communication goes downhill the more pressure we have, because we're starting to get bigger muscles involved. We're stiffer with it, so we're not flowing with the glider as much, and we don't have as much finesse. Does that make sense? So you want just your normal communication pressure is just enough to feel the changes and follow the changes. Finesse is the name of the game, right? If you're finding yourself like this in the air, you're not feeling that glider very good. You're, you're adding a lot of drag to the glider and your, your performance is gonna go down, but then your control of turbulent air is gonna go down as well, right? Um, so we get our turn done. We want a lot of our turn done through weight shift and obviously we're gonna need brake to get some of our turn done as well. Think about, some thermals are beautiful and smooth and awesome, but who's been in turbulent thermals, right? Some thermals are pretty turbulent. Sometimes we're getting rocked around while we're trying to make this 360 and the inside wing keeps coming up and it keeps trying to throw us out and all that stuff. Well, guess what? If the air is seeing this, you get thrown around a lot more. Does that make sense? This feels the changes a whole lot more than just enough brakes to have communication. Does that make sense? So if you're sitting neutral in your seat and only using brakes to the yard the glider around and using a lot of brakes here because you're a little nervous also, you get thrown around a whole lot more than that pilot who's nice and light on the brakes, using what they need to do to get the turn radius done, but not nice and light on the brakes with just communication pressure on the outside. We still want to know what that outside wing's doing, but just communication pressure and using their hips to affect the glider as well. Does that make sense? Cool. So, Really think about how that glider wants to cut through the air, right? We want it to be this knife cutting through the air. If we put a ton of brake on, which it happens when some pilots get nervous, right? They start to pull down the brakes, they start to get really heavy. We're not feeling the glider really well when I'm using those big muscles in the back of my back and shoulders and stuff. It's just not, we're not finessed in that way, right? And we're, we're asking the turbulence, hey, could you throw me around more? Right? I want to go really slow with a lot of drag so you can just throw me around a ton. Right? If we're riding a bike in the wind, 
if we if we ride like this, we get thrown around by the wind. But if we ride like this, we don't, right? So same thing here, right? We want that glider to be really felt, really smooth moving through the air. Cool. While we're talking about that outside hand, right? Our brake cascade, right? Uh, our brakes come through a cascade, right? Bunch of lines coming down to one brake line, right? Then the one brake line goes through that little pulley that's connected to the riser, right? It might be connected to the riser by something this long or by something this long, but there's always some length there. And then it comes, it comes into your hand, right? So if my, if my outside hand, let's say I'm doing a right turn, if my outside hand is way out here, what part of the brake cascade am I feeling more? The middle. The middle. The middle. What what part of the brake what part of the brake cascade do you think I want to feel more of? The tip. The tip. Yeah. Or at least everything even. Right? Right? And on different gliders, this effect will will be bigger or smaller, but there's some effect on all of our gliders, right? There's there's some difference on all of our gliders. So if I'm making a right turn and I have my hand way out here, which who does this? It's all right. Yeah, I used to. Right? Well, and I, we see a lot of pilots doing it, right? It feels kind of comfortable because this pushes, pushes you in your weight shift. It feels like you're balanced out here. Just that fine tension and balance kind of thing, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, in theory, it, it, but yeah. you're right. But here's the thing, right? If we're feeling the center of the glider, we need to have more brake on to have trip tip communication, right? And therefore, we're causing more drag, right? Therefore, we're, we're, we're slowing down the side of the glider that we want to be turning around the other side. We want that side of the glider to be pretty darn, darn aerodynamic, to be pretty darn spelt, right? Making it, making it through the air. So a good place to have your hands in, in this situation is in line with the riser. In line with the riser is always even on the brake cascade, right? And you can't really do wrong even on the brake cascade, right? Like acro pilots like their hands out here because they want to stall the middle of the glider before the tips because naturally the tips want to stall first, right? Because they're smaller. Right? They'd like to stall first, but in Acro, we, we, we try to practice a lot of tricks out here so that you can stall the whole glider at the same time. But in cross country, we, we want to be feeling those tips. Right? The tip is really where the communication is. Does that make sense? So outside hand in line with the risers is a pretty good place. When I fly my comp wing, you know, high aspect ratio, skinny glider, my outside hand is a touch inside the riser. Yeah, I'm feeling it like this. Yeah, I'm feeling that outside tip because I'm really concerned with what that tip is doing, and I want that, that side of the glider to come through. Now, I'll tell you, in, in the World Championship in the Super Final, about 50% of the pilots at this point, and it was, it was fewer a couple years ago, so it'll be more next year, are flying with their outside hand on the rear riser, not brake, right? Why do you think that is? It's less drag. Less drag on that side, right? They feel. Uh, especially on a two-liner, you have quite a bit of communication through the rear riser, through the bees, right? And that communication is not at a sacrifice of the scoop. That communication is somewhere around there, right? So it's not nearly as draggy, and you feel the glider. So not not that you guys should all go around and have have your outer hand on the rear riser, but know that like at, at the highest levels of paragliding, people are finding that like that brake scoop on the outside wing, like. It, Makes a real performance difference. Okay. I have a question. Yeah. Well, when does this start working? This T line? Does it work on delta or highest pressure? So, rear riser control. Um, in in thermaling. In thermaling. I'm not doing it on on three liners. I'm doing it on two liners. I'm not doing it. I don't feel like I have enough communication. Mm -hmm. To really feel the thermal on a three-liner, a two-liner, I do. I still feel, even at like the super final world championship level, I still feel like if it's a if it's a squirrely thermal that really needs perfect communication to follow, I might be better chasing it with brakes, with, with my outside hand on the brakes than with my outside hand on the rears. So I still think there's even on a two-liner more communication through the brakes, and it makes sense because of the scoop, right? We're feeling subtle differences more because of that scoop. So um, I'm, I'm actually not one to do it like all the time at those high level races. I do it some, right? Smooth, weak thermals, I'm doing it. And then kind of the rowdy ones, I feel like I'm better to put myself in the right place with thermals. How do you determine? Just by feel of what that, like <coughs> the benefits of having the risers compared to the brakes or like 
what they yeah, by, by feel. And like I said, like the really weak, slow climbs, this drag difference is going to be the bigger difference between how I climb and someone else climbs, right? But then these rowdy climbs, your communication and ability to put the glider at just the right place in the thermal is going to be the performance difference. Okay. Does that make sense? So it's like in, in huge open thermals that are really weak, the performance difference is going to be in the drag. And in rowdy thermals, it's going to be in the communication, your ability to use that communication. Good question. Yeah. yeah. So that stuff makes sense? Okay, cool. Let's go a little bit deeper into it. I think the best way to use this board is going to be on the ground in the middle. Oops. Ah, I got it. Um, so if anyone can't see, come in tighter, and that will be, that'll be nice to come in tighter anyway. I'm not sure if we're going to be perfect for the video, but oh well. Because we're kind of looking at a thermal from above anyway. So. We want the dead markers to go into the garbage can, but so you just, okay, cool. just they haven't been used in, in, in two years. No. Okay, if I, if I find any bad ones, they'll, they'll yeah, be just throw them a case in. Okay. <laughs> um, so now let's talk about how to make these three sections, right? First of all, when we're thermaling, our visual references are like almost gone, right? Sure, sometimes we make our first 360, 500, 600 feet away from terrain, but when we're a thousand feet above terrain, 2,000 feet, 3,000 feet, visual references on the ground are doing you like very little good, right? Um, our ability to put ourselves in space, to map where we are in space, is all about the shape of our circle, the shape of our 360. Does that make sense? So if we're doing nice even 360s, then I can accurately say in my mind, oh, I was going up better on this side and I wasn't going up as well on this side. Does that make sense, right? But if we're not, if our 360s are kind of looking like this, has everyone, anyone used that tool, Avery? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Anyone seen like beautiful 360s in your track on Avery? Mm -hmm. Anyone seen bad ones? Mm -hmm. Sometimes, right? Yeah. So if you're looking at Avery and you're seeing 360s like this, right, all over the place, not stacked on each other, not nice. Obviously, they, they might drift with the wind a little bit, but you want really nice 360s. That has a lot to do with your ability to mentally map where you all are in this column of lift, right? And if it's like that, you have no idea. Like, okay, I felt more lift back there but where was back there? And was it because I'm swinging through my glider? Every time we change turn, right, we have some swing motion in the glider that's gonna affect the gravity we feel in the harness, what the varial says to us, because wind pressure change the various pressure, right? Um, and we're gonna be swinging around, so even our altitude, right? So even actually going up or down for swinging around is not actual information about the air we're in, it's more information about what we're doing under the glider. Does that make sense? So this nice, constantly baked 360 is our goal, because then we have less messing with our data, right? We have less interference with our data from us being thrown around or throwing ourselves around underneath the glider, and we have a better, better <coughs> mental map, right? Um, when the thermal is really nice and smooth, right? When it's this nice, big, smooth thermal, yeah, we can look around the turn, put our weight shift in, put our brake in, and it's going to be a 360 turn if we just keep everything the same, right? It's going to be a 360 turn. It's going to work well. But sometimes the thermals aren't smooth, right? Sometimes they're these bumpy, chunky things, and they're kind of throwing us around a little bit. One analogy I have there, any skiers in the room? Mm -hmm. Snowboarders? Yeah, sweet. Mm -hmm. And if you're not, you probably know something about this. We'll fix around here. Um, <laughs> um, is skiing like... Let's say powder or groomer versus ski, ski, skiing crud stuff, right? If you're skiing powder or groomer, right? Someone from a mile away can see this beautiful, nice, big carving turn, and then they look, they look at the edges of your skis, they zoom in, look at the edges of your skis, boots, knees, everything, and yeah, sure, you put the edges in and like keep them about the same pressure, and the skis just do this nice big carving turn, right? Or snowboard, whatever it is, right? But if it's crud snow, same thing, a really good skier, a really good snowboarder, Someone can look at them from two miles away and see this really beautiful carving turn, but then if you were to zoom in on their edges, on their knees, on their the whole thing, you'd see stuff going on, right? And we know good skiers can do that, right? Good skiers can 
make a beautiful carving turn through really variable snow conditions. And it's not as if they're thinking, okay, right now I need to come off pre edge pressure, right now I need to go on, right now I need to come off it. They're, they're just kind of feeling it and working, right? Very similar thing with carving a, a, a paraglider through a turbulent thermal, right? You're looking around, you're feeling the glider, and you might be going like this a little bit, right? You might be working it to keep that glider on edge and keep it going, right? And same thing with the spectators, right? A good pilot in turbulent conditions, you don't look at the glider to see if it's turbulent. You look at the pilot's weight shift and hands, right? If they're a good pilot in turbulent conditions, the glider can be very nice and smooth and making beautiful smooth turns. But if you see their weight shift and hands going like this, it's turbulent conditions out there, right? And then if they're a beginner pilot, you can just look at the glider. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a question. Yeah. Does it help just watching your tip to be dropped in the same place and you just keep the tip on the same altitude towards the horizon? Yeah, I, th I think that is, that is a help. Yeah. Yeah. That, um, but you're, you're not doing that. Relative you're, to the horizon. Um, you know, I look around my, my turn kind of at the tip. But if I'm doing it, it's in my subconscious. It's not something I've concentrated on. Great question. Yeah, but it's not something I've concentrated on. Um, too much visual focus in any one place could also distract us from seeing birds and stuff. I'm not saying it's a wrong thing. And absolutely, that's going to give us a good idea of our bank angle. And there, if our bank angle is steady, we're, it's going to make a steady turn, right? So that, that could be a very good, um, very good tool I would use. Or how to... Not in my conscious mind music. Probably my subconscious sees the tip a lot. Um, now I just wanted to get into this whole side thing about how to look for birds, but I won't. <laughs> in, in, in a later time, we'll talk about scanning. <laughs> it's important. Um, cool. So turning 360s. Let's say for a moment that, once again, I'm simplifying everything, but that's the way it has to be. Um, that, that X right there, has more lift than the rest of the, the rest of the thermal, right? We're going up everywhere else, but that X has more lift, and I'd actually like my circle to be centered like on that X, right? Cool. So I fly into this, fly into this column of lift. One, one thousand, two, one thousand, three, one thousand. I start turning. Oh, cool. Okay, I'm going up, going up, going up. Okay, I'm not going up as much. I'm actually not going to make a major big change right there. What I'm going to do is just remember, okay, I'm not going up as much. When I'm on the opposite side, I'm going to extend my circle, right? Okay, I'm going up really, really nice. I'm going up really nice. Boom, I hit more lift, right? I'm near the X. What would happen right now if I extended my circle towards that X is that I'd actually be extending my circle that way. Do you see? Because I'm a step behind, aren't I? Mm -hmm. Can everyone kind of see that? Mm -hmm. So instead, on the 180 away from it, I'm going to cut this side a little shorter. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? So what I do when I'm thermaling is instead of like make immediate changes to my turn radius based on what I'm feeling right now, I make a change on the other side of the circle, then back to this side of the circle, mm -hmm. right? So let's start this again, right? I'm turning, feel more, more lift right here. I'm going to keep my turn radius the same. And then on the opposite side, I'm going to cut it in a little bit, right? But I still remember, oh, I didn't feel more over there. So on this side, I'm going to deliberately open it up a little bit. Why do you guys think I'm saying a little bit? So what is it? Yeah, so it could shift. And so I don't have a lot, of, so I'm not turning like this, right? So I'm not making these big, crazy movements, which is going to throw off my mental maps. Small, really predictable movements is going to help our mental map. Does that make sense, right? So I'm coming around here, and I just extended the turn a little bit, but because I cut this side off a little bit, it was actually a decent shift, right? Extended the turn a little bit, cool. Going up more again right there, right? And predictably, which I already know, I'm going up more there. The last couple turns, I felt less here. So I'm gonna cut this side off short, and predictably, oh cool, I am going up less over here, right? And then I'm gonna open the side up more. Okay, more again here. Now let's say we went this way enough, right? And let, let's say now, which thermals are shifty and the wind shifts as we go up, so the upwind side changes and stuff like that. Let's say now this X is the one, right? Cool. So I'm going around, right? 
going around. I, I anticipate that I might be cutting this side off shorter, and then, boom, I feel more lift. Oh, cool. Okay. Well, this side of the thermal, maybe I drew the X in the wrong place, but this side of the thermal is liftier than that side. So what I'm going to do on this side, what am I going to do? Shorten Short it just a little bit, right? And then on this side, I'm going to extend it just a little bit, right? And in this way, we're kind of like always making these little adjustments the whole way up, and it should be small adjustments. And guess what? The thermal will be making adjustments the whole way up, right? We know wind direction changes as we go up, right? How often is the wind different in landing than takeoff? Pretty often. This is a pretty small mountain, right? So we've got changes in wind as we go up. One thermal you're cracking off over here is going to change the wind around it. All, all sorts of changes going on. So the thermal's reorganized as it goes up. It's shifting around. Remember, it's a little bit more like a lava lamp than this simple panel talking about. But I see a lot of people making these like immediate huge shifts as they're thermaling, and it throws off your mental map, and it makes it really, really hard to see where you are in space, right? So I'll, I'll just kind of show it one more time with. With, with, with the lift, because I'm not sure I, I um, really showed it that well. If I'm coming around, if I'm coming around a circle and I feel more lift, boom, if I say, oh, I feel more lift, and I flatten out, and then I go back into the climb, and I say, oh, I felt more lift, and I flatten out, and then you see, you see how like my circle's not actually shifting towards the climb, because I'm a touch behind that more lift, aren't I? I'm actually shifting it like a little bit different. And it's the same thing with sync, right? Um, yeah, that stuff makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, what was the point when you did corrections? You said 180, but then you said that you did two, two corrections per, uh, per rotation. Yeah, so, yeah, so let, 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 let me map it out a little bit while I'm walking around, right? So your side of the thermal has more lift, right? So, beep, 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 so I'm staying in the turn, but that side wasn't so good. So I'm not going to walk over the whiteboard, but let's pretend I walk over the whiteboard here. Right? So a little bit closer to this side. So you made correction on 90 degrees. Like well, so I didn't mean to if I did. Oh, okay. Sorry. So, <laughs> so he just tightened it up. Yeah. So now I tighten this side up. Okay. I didn't mean to make If it looked like I made a correction there, sorry. Uh, so I tighten up this side, and then I'm actually going to extend this side. And in this way, I'm planning, right? Yes. If instead, if instead I say, oh, sorry, sorry, beep, 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 and I open up this way, I didn't open up towards you. Does that make sense? I opened up a 20 degrees past you or something, you know, whatever degrees past you it was, and that will depend on the radius of the turn. So that, does that kind of make sense? And it's, it's a very similar thing with lift, with, with sync. So, and, and you guys try, and you know, the other thing I'm, I'm happy to admit is I don't know everything, right? And I've been, I've been kind of teaching this thermaline technique for a while, and doing this in, in my head too, and um, and I climb pretty good. So, you know, I think it, it works out pretty well. Um, so I have a question. Yeah. Um, sometimes when you go into a thermal, it seems to work better at a better angle or a steeper bank going into it, and sometimes it works better going in a little bit flatter yeah. and you get more lift. And Great question. I like it. Um, so. Thermals are different sizes, right? And when do we have the lowest sink rate? When are we going down the slowest? Or when we're flying in a straight line, where are limbs, wings level, right? So, yeah, maybe it was a confusing question. Um, yeah, when we're, our, our wings are level, we're, we're going down the slowest, right? Wings level, no brake, no speed bar, we're going down the slowest. Right, that, that's our lowest sink rate. Maybe a little, actually, maybe a little bit of break, right? But anyway, somewhere around there is our lowest sink rate. Any amount of turn we put in increases our sink rate, right? So a spiral dive is really hard to, to thermal up with, right? You need a pretty darn strong thermal. But you can fit a spiral into a very small column, right? And, you know, like a huge three minute turn is a very low sink rate. We're almost like flat sink rate, right? But we need a pretty darn big thermal for that to work, right? So each thermal and each part of the thermal, because thermals might go like this as you go up in atmosphere, right? Because there's stability layer. The lapse rate isn't the same all through the atmosphere. And there's other thermals joining in and stuff like that. So thermals, 
in my experience, sometimes they're big and sometimes that same thermal will get small for a few hundred feet and then get big, usually because of the stability layer in the atmosphere, um, in, the, in the lapse rate, right, and how, how fast the temperature is getting colder as we go along. Um, so I want the right turn radius to be inside the thermal for the whole turn, right? And if the thermal's small and strong, I can afford a pretty steep turn radius, right? A couple advantages to steep turn radiuses is the G-force kind of makes it easier to stay in the turn. You guys have felt that, right? Mm -hmm. When you're steep, you, you kind of get thrown around a little less because actually your wing loading goes up, yeah. right? You have more weight on that glider because mm -hmm. if you're feeling a G and a half, that's 1.5 times your weight on that glider now, right? It's more loaded. So, um, so steep turns are kind of nice for that. That also, so it makes, the, makes it easier to stay in the turn. It also makes the glider less likely to collapse, right? Because of that, less likely to collapse is also less communication coming through, through you. So if like a flatter turn is gonna give you more communication, right? Um, so it's a complicated answer. Does that make sense? Because ultimately there, every thermal and every part of the thermal might have just the right radius. Right? There's, there's, um, man, what, I think Kelly Farina's book, he says a perfect 360 is 15 seconds. You should always aim for 15 seconds. I think it's a good, like, starting point. In my opinion, it's a pretty wide 360, 15 seconds. Mm -hmm. But, um, it's a good starting point. So maybe, like, almost about four seconds per quarter. Maybe he says 16 seconds. Four seconds, he does, right? Is that right? Okay. Yeah, yeah, 16 seconds. Four seconds per quarter. And it's pretty easy to count those out, right? So if you want to aim for something, sure. But a lot of my circles are 9, 10 second circles, and sometimes they're 30 second circles, right? It really depends on the air, right? The tricky times is small thermals, small columns of rising air that are also weak, right? Because then they just won't support this big bank angle, right? Kind of, you know, even if the thermal's huge, if it's going up at a thousand feet a minute, it'll support a pretty big bank angle. And then, yeah, your buddy who's doing wider turns might climb faster than you, but you're climbing with a high bank angle, right? So not so bad. But the tricky thing is small, small thermal thermals that are weak just don't support a very big bank angle. And then you might be thinking, okay, I want to turn within the thermal and then do this really wide thing away from it and then turn within it. Because if we have to turn sometime, in the lift is the best place to turn. We're, we, we, maybe we've learned that with like ridge soaring, right? If you're soaring a ridge and the lift band's like kind of small and scraggly, you put your, you put your figure eights, you put your 180s in, in lift, right? Because that's where you'll, you'll be causing the most sink. And when we're flying straight and level, we're not going down very fast, right? So I do find those the hardest, like weak, small cores, right? like because you can't get the full 360 in them. So you gotta kind of plan to be pretty flat when you're not in them, so you're not falling very fast, and then spend a fair amount of time in them, but also like get some of the turn done in them. It's tricky. If you can find two of them, then you can figure it, right? Mm -hmm. um, any other questions kind of in this room? I was thinking of shifting. Yeah. Do you slow it down when you get to the center of the thermal? And yes, how much? And if, if yes, how much? Very good question. So, uh, fantastic question. Um, so sailplane pilots and hang gliders before us and early paragliders, when I got into thermal flying, everyone said, oh, slow the glider down as you get into a thermal, right? And at, at, th there's some design changes that makes, um, that makes minimum sink closer to trim than it was 10 years ago or even 15 years ago, right? Um, the, the concept is, is not wrong of slowing down, right? Basically, minimum sink, which is some amount of brake on. I like to talk about minimum sink as like four pounds of brakes. It's not like brakes down here, right? Um, on most of our gliders, minimum sink might be like four or five pounds of brake. Maybe a little, a little bit more than communication pressure, but not crazy. Um, minimum sink is going to give us the lowest sink rate, and therefore, all else being equal, the best climb rate. The problem is the scoop, right? We have way less authority over our glider when we have all that break in, right? 
and our sync rate's pretty darn good anyway. Does that make sense? So having the authority over your glider to be able to cut through that air and put your glider where you want, for me, is way more important than minimum sync. And I'll tell you right now, at the highest level of paragliding, in the World Championships, Super Final, that sort of thing, no one's flying around on minimum sync, even on the really weak days. No, one, no one's adding a bunch of brake to their glider and thermaling with a bunch of brake on, right? In fact, as it gets weaker, that's when you're seeing more and more pilots using the rear riser, no brake on, right? Because they want this glider that cuts through the air and really gives them ultimately authority on where they put their glider and brakes and stuff like that. I, so for pure efficiency of thermaling, I don't, I don't think it's more efficient. The reason I think it was talked about a lot is older paraglide designs had more of a difference between trim speed and minimum sync, right? And we learned thermaline from sailplanes and hang gliders. They were here first, right? And they, they slow down in thermal, right? Because their trim speed's pretty darn fast. Yeah, our trim speed's not that fast. Just, just to make sure I'm understanding rule number two, if you came into that thermal, you're across when you're perpendicular to the wind direction, there's nobody else in there that you're needing to follow. Would you have turned left instead of right to come? So if this is, if this is the wind direction, yeah. and you're saying I came in Just like with that. no asymmetric movement. Yep, and there's nobody else yeah. in there. Yeah, I would have turned left. Because turn this side of the thermal is this side of the thermal, yeah. right? Is, is, is the upwind side of the thermal, which our glide ratio interacts best with, is easiest to mentally map has less junk trying to lead us off course, less sucker bubbles. Yeah. Good question. Thanks for clarifying that. Yeah. Um, now I want to talk about thermaline with a friend, or with three friends, or four friends. OK? Um, the cool thing about thermaline with other people is it's much easier on mental mapping. And guys, since, since I came late and all that, if anyone has to step up and go and all that, um, please feel free. And once in a while, if someone looks outside and tells us if it looks epic out, we can get all excited to fly too. <laughs> it's a lot, lot sunnier than I was expecting. <laughs> yeah. um, so so you, no one's going to be rude, and I was, I was incredibly rude to be here late, so once again, I apologize for that. Um, it's a good story, though, a good excuse. <laughs> <laughs> it's not really, right? I just didn't bring a map. And, like, you know, at the woods here, I was running around in the woods and, you know. <laughs> I was thinking, oh, it'd be nice to go for a run before my talk and get my head straight and all that. And I ended up just being stressed about finding the trail. <laughs> um, yeah, thermaling with others. So when we're thermaling with others, our mental mapping goes way up, right? Because we have this, this evidence of what's happening wherever that other pilot is, right? So thermaling with others is really, really good, right? Anytime someone within reach is out climbing you, Get to them like that, right? Go, go join that circle they're in. Thank you. Like that, <clears throat> ASAP, right? Even if you think they're out climbing you, but you're not sure, don't wait two turns to be sure. Just go get over with them. Because two pilots are going to work way better than one together. Does that make sense? Um, even if, I even, I even think if we're going up at the same rate, me, me and a friend, but we're, let's say, a quarter mile from each other, if I can get over to that friend and work with him, we're going to be going up at a better rate. So I even say if your climb rate's neutral compared to the other person, if you can get over and be somewhat in their altitude, you're going to work that thermal better as two people and you're going to get a better overall climb rate, right? The, the pilots you want to go join are the pilots below you climbing up or that you can come in within a couple hundred feet of. Right? A couple hundred feet below a pilot, it's usable to use their information. Three, four, five hundred feet, it becomes unusable. Right? They're, they're up here and useless. Right? For a couple of reasons. If I come in over top pilot, that pilot's climbing, that thermal's coming up to me, right? It might not even be here yet, right? Every thermal has a beginning, right? So this could be the top of the thermal that that pilot's in, but guess what? I can just sit on them and th they'll be on me. Sweet. Right? If I come in at their level, I'm pretty sure I'm going to find lift because they're going up. Right? But if I come in under them, guess what? Every thermal has an end pulling up the ladder. Right? Every thermal has an end, so you might get there and the thermal might legitimately not be there anymore. Right? Also, there's drift and everything to this thermals. And remember, we said the wind changes, so sometimes a vertical profile of a thermal might look like that, like that, like, right? It's changing as you go up. Right? 
So it's pretty hard to see someone a thousand feet up and say, oh, I'm going to come in under them and there's going to be a thermal right there. No, your lift that was maybe half the climb rate back there is, is better evidence than that. But if you can, if they're climbing at twice your climb rate and below you, hey, scoot on over there and get a bubble. Boom, that's going to give you a better climb rate and allow you to work as a team, which is much more efficient. Um, Below you are your friends, and you want a lot of friends. <laughs> exactly. So, these are two people. Great draw, I know. These are two people in a thermal doing circles, right? You want to be 180 degree apart from your buddy. If it's just two people in a thermal, you want to be right apart from them, right? And most of our gliders go the same speed, right? Even like an EMB glider and a comp wing have the same trim speed. Right? The comp wings have a lot more at the top of the speed range, but they don't give us tons of more trim speed because then we don't fit in the thermals. Right? We want to be able to thermal them well. So, like most of our gliders have about the same trim speed. Obviously, if you're at the top of the weight range or at the bottom of the weight range, there are differences. Speed wings, mini wings are different. People flying tandem solo, that's different. But a lot of our gliders go about the same speed. So if you're directly across the thermal from someone, you have evidence of what's happening to them and they have evidence of what's happening to you, right? But if, if you're right behind someone, right, right behind them here, you have evidence of them, but they can't see you, right? So it's really only one person is using the team thing here. And even your evidence of them, you're kind of too late, right? Oh, they went up. Well, now you're right there, you're gonna go up too. Oh, they, they <clears> fell in the sink. Well, now you're right there, you're gonna fall in the sink too, right? But if you're apart from them, you can, you can do something different. Does that make sense? Cool. Who wants to be a volunteer here? Who's tired? Who just yawned? You just yawned. Did yes. <laughs> I yawn? Yes. I was looking out and seeing people yawn. I'm like, oh, we gotta get up and get moving. So we'll, we'll all get up in just a second. Don't worry. Yeah. I'll get us all. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So we're circling in a thermal, going about the same speed. There's, there's all sorts of things to step over. Um, if you see me go up compared to you, right, means I'm in better better air, right? Tell me your name. JC. I'm in better air than JC right now, right? We might both be going up, but relative to her, I'm going up more. What JC wants to do is actually aim back there. JC wants to pretend there's like a 20 or 30 foot streamer coming off me and aim for the back of the streamer. Watch what this does. You're, you're going to end up walking all over them. That's okay. So follow that streamer. I'm going up more compared to you. Okay, now I'm not going up as much compared to you. And you see how she's just, she's gonna extend the circle out this way. Does that make sense to everyone? Whereas a, a pretty normal thing for people to do, thanks JC, come, come on back, sorry. <laughs> you yawn, you know? You're, you're, you're. <laughs> um, if JC is going, well sorry, a pretty normal thing for people to do, let's say JC is going up compared to me, is to say, oh JC is going up compared to me, and face her, now let's keep walking around the circle. Do you see how I actually just cut off the good part? Yeah. Does that make sense? So following that streamer extends the good part and you actually start mapping the thermal over. So what actually happened, right, is, you know, we'll go back to the first example, right? So that part of the thermal is better than the first example. JC followed me out there a little bit by following the streamer. And now I'm here and if I see JC going up again, I'm going to follow the streamer again and we're going to extend out a little bit more until I don't see her going up or she doesn't see me going up and then we won't extend out this way anymore. Does that make sense? Yeah. So if they're going up compared to you, remember follow the streamer for as long as they're going up compared to you. That's going to extend that part of the turn, right? If they're going down compared to you, that's when we aim right at the back of their harness, right? So JC's going down compared to me, somewhere near the, the red glider there, she's going down compared to me, I'm going to aim at the back of her harness. Now she's not going down compared to me anymore. Cool. I just cut off that part of the thermal. Do you see? And once again, we'd work together to continue to cut off the worst side of the thermal as, as we go. And like that, we'd be shifting this thermal all around. And it works with two people. It works with five people too. Same thing. Right? Do the same thing. It works really, really well. And a lot of people get that backwards. Say, oh, she's going up more compared to me and aim right at her. But in fact, because we're moving around this circle in space, that actually means you're cutting off that part of the thermal. Isn't that weird? Yeah. Right? Cool. 
for, for being like 180 degrees from a single friend, if there's five people, what's the best way to have placement? Yeah, let's get a few more people. Yeah, and like I said, within a few hundred feet, this can still work great. Once you start to get more than a few hundred feet away from each other, that's when you're not seeing the vertical differences as well. But I'd say like kind of within 100 meters, which is 300 feet, so, somewhere around there, it still works pretty well because you can still they're still going up compared to me, right? That that's. Somewhere around like two or three hundred feet is pretty good. Okay, so let's get a few of us walking around a circle. Right? And I'm going down compared to everyone. So you kind of aim at my ass. It's, he's still be cutting it off, right? And let's say he's going down too. So you aim at his ass. And then boom, boom. And we've just cut that side of the circle off, right? And now let's say I'm going up compared to everyone. You still aim at that streamer. Yeah. He's still going up compared to everyone. He still aims at that streamer. And he's not going up compared to anyone anymore. So that was far enough. You see how we just cut out for a little bit and then that was far enough. So it still works, right? And it's, it still works pretty well. Maybe the length of the streamer changes a little bit. That's what I would almost yeah, see like yeah. that when you, yeah. when you know the guy got left and you shorten the streamer and if he got uh, or if he got sank, you shorten the streamer, if he got lift. Yeah, yeah sink is pretty much aiming right at him. Cutting that turn closer. Yeah. Hi. So I was just going to walk around the backside so that I'm not serving. Oh, cool. You, you can walk right through us. You already know you're here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's a couple chairs. Yeah. I know there was a step behind you. You have to do flying so motions. Yeah, I would. Yeah. <laughs> um, any, any questions on that stuff? Let, let, let's just, since we talked about thermal and groups, let's go over the basics. I think everyone knows this, but it's really good things to go over. Um, if we're coming into a circle and people are turning in a direction, turn away. Turn away, right? Um, how about the radius of the turn? Keep it the same, right? Basically, join their turn radius. And guess what? You might be an amazing thermal or really, really smart and think you can do it better than this group. But when you're in the group, don't be, don't be inconsiderate, right? Especially the people who showed you the thermal that you're getting in. You know, like you should be bowing down to them, right? They showed you lift. Don't come in there and be an asshole and cut, cut everyone off and throw them out of the thermal, right? Come in. If this is the thermal going around right here, I join on the side where I see people's backs, right? Basically, that means you're joining on the side like this, right? You're, you're joining like that. And it's like joining a roundabout in a car with no brakes, right? <laughs> Basically, right, we don't get to stop at the yield sign. We have, we have to look at the traffic and be on the outside, on the outside, on the outside, wait for a time to come in, and then just, just slot ourselves in. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Cool. And then we're gonna turn with them about the same radius and making these little adjustments. You don't wanna be the one cutting through the middle, blowing people up, all that stuff. You might be really, really good at thermaline alone and have really good independent thinking at thermaline alone, but you just have to throw all that out when you're thermaline in a group, right? It's like a uh, bowling ball. Yeah, exactly. We've all, who's felt that here, right? When someone just charges into the middle of the thermal and everyone who was showing that thermal scatters. Yeah. Right? It's like, oh, great. Now that, like, 30 terms of mental mapping just got thrown into the wind, right? When you come into a thermal, that pilot who's been there mentally mapping it for 20 turns has a good idea of things. You want to use them. You don't want to blow them off. Does that make sense? Yeah. Even at, like, world championship level, we're being considerate in thermals, right? Because it works better working as a group, right? You don't thermal by yourself nearly as fast as you do as a group, right? So you want to be considerate in thermals. That's, you also want to think like, hey, I want, to, I want all these people to enjoy flying with me, right? Because the more pilots you have around you, the more the air is mapped out for you. The more you know where the lift is, the sink is, all that stuff. If all pilots think of you as this asshole who just blows into thermals and knocks everyone off, and when you leave for the North Ridge, they're going to be like, oh, I don't like to fly with that guy. I want to go over by myself, you know? <laughs> but if you're a thermal, if you're a pilot everyone likes to fly with, when you leave for the North Ridge, people are going to come with you. And then you're going to get to the North, North Ridge. You have two pilots there, two pilots there. You can look around. Okay, where's the left? Oh, there it is. Okay. You know, it's easy. It's easy when you're a nice pilot. So, so now the question is, uh, when do you decide to leave a thermal, and which uh, position, which angle, which line you choose to leave a uh, thermal? Great question. 
So, the success, to, to have success beginning your fly, flying, you want to have lots of air time, right? You want to be up there flying a lot, feeling the thermals a lot, and that pretty much means don't leave the thermal, right? Take, it, take every thermal to the very, very top, because that's going to give, give you the most hours in the air, the most experienced flying thermals, the least bomb outs. It, it's, it's going to be good for you, right? So I think most people in this room are probably in that boat where like, just more repetition, more flying is going to be better for their flying than trying to be super efficient as far as distance versus time, right? When we're talking about flying out of lift, right? I'm in a thermal, but I'm leaving it. It's a distance versus time thing. You're, you're just saying like, hey, I'm going for maximum distance today. I don't, you know, it's, that, that's what you're going for. Mm -hmm. Of course, there are some thermals that are drifting you into the mountains or away from landing zones. You might leave them sooner, mm -hmm. right? You, you would leave them sooner. Um, there's, there's some events where you might leave the thermal thunderstorms. Right? If there's a thunderstorm over there, don't stay in the way. Right? <laughs> Stuff like that. But for the most part, you guys want to maximize your time in thermals to learn about them, right? So take them to the top. Now, for efficiency's sake, right, um, that, we leave the thermals. We, we get an idea for the day and what's a strong thermal. And if we're in the top third of the usable lift, right, so if, if cloud base down to the ground is, is three-thirds of usable lift, the top third of the usable lift, and our thermal is, gets weaker than the average thermal strength of the day, we leave it, right? If we're in the middle third, we might leave it. Or in the bottom third, we probably don't. Yeah. But I've seen uh, experienced pilots. They they leave a thermal that's still decent, and they pick a line, and then they actually climb better than I was in the thermal. Right? Yeah. So that's a mystery to me. Is, oh, they well, if there's better there. lift there, you better get to it. But, but how do they sense, right? The, where are you <laughs> going? Obviously, good two, three uh, feet right this yeah. way, just left. And take a better line. That class is my money. <laughs> <laughs> no, so I think so, some stuff that you're talking about is like almost subconscious. It'd be very hard for me to explain it and yeah. to say exactly what I'm feeling. Although, like, that's happened to me, right? Where, where I just had this feeling there's more lift over there. Yeah, yeah. More often, I wouldn't be surprised if they're seeing a bird. If they, they felt like on every turn there was a little more lift there, mm -hmm. if they saw another pilot low down climbing over there, oh. I wouldn't be surprised if it's just that they're observing a little bit wider, yeah. right? And this is totally normal too. When you're newer at thermaling, man, it takes all of your brain ram yeah. just to be interacting with this thermal and, and tracking it, right? And doing the circles in circular fashions and all that stuff. But then as you do it more and more and more, your brain starts to open up more and more where the thermaling gets subconscious. Mm -hmm. The thermaling can happen and you can be looking over there, checking the next ridge out for birds climbing, look at how the clouds are. Mm -hmm. you, can be, you can be feeling your glider, you can be thinking a couple stages in advance, mm -hmm. you can be checking wind talkers on the ground, mm -hmm. talk, talking on the radio, whatever, and still thermaling pretty nice, mm -hmm. right? So one thing experienced pilots have, the more experienced pilots have with thermaling, they have more brain capacity to be away from the thermal. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. And they, they're probably seeing birds, they're seeing fluff in the air, they might see a cloud form that like, it makes sense that the new thermal pilot's not seeing because it's taking a whole lot of brain energy just to just to make nice circles, yeah. right? Yeah. So in the same thermal, right, the climb rate of the glider versus an eagle, is eagle always uh, all climb you or it's about the same? I usually feel like I'm about the same climb rate as like a Cooper's Hawk or Red Tail Hawk. Okay. Right, I think the sink rate's Smaller. about the same. So, so I have a higher sink rate than let's say most vultures mm -hmm. okay. and a, um, you, a better sink rate than like Peregrine Falcons. Mm -hmm. They can they, they can be more agile, but yeah. So I usually, I, I feel like we have a pretty similar sink rate to like a Cooper's Hawk, uh, yeah, Red Tail Hawk. So that's wow. different radius circles, but if they're turning the same radius, I feel like we go. And if you don't know what the Cooper's Hawk sink rate is, that would be. I'm I'm just amazed. <laughs> such a specific answer. Yeah. 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 Wow! I thought you were joking at first. You guys are serious. This is a sarcastic answer to start with. It's basically a smaller. Sometimes the vultures fly with us on purpose, even though they're sink rate. Yeah. Yeah, they can they can 
turn an entire course, yeah. and they can relaunch from the trees they land. Yeah. <laughs> so, they have some more options than us because of the tree. Sometimes they'll dive into an area and you're like, well, oh, no, you're a hawk. You can land over there. Yeah. <laughs> well, we can land there, but not relaunch. Yeah. <laughs> the reason I ask this question is I, I'm seeing that I climb better than a bird, and sometimes I see a, a bird climb better than me yeah. in the same circles. A pretty good rule that someone told me once was um, never let anything out climb you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but shoot the bird. <laughs> <laughs> no, but what it means is like another. This is opposite to what I just said, right? I said never leave lift. Uh, another good rule someone once told me is never be happy with the lift you're in. Mm -hmm. Once again, it's a ram thing, right? But what it means is anytime I'm thermaling, I'm looking around for that glider climbing better than me, that that bird climbing faster than me, right? I'm always willing to make a move to it. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. I have a question about what he was asking. He says, you know, that he's thermal with somebody and they leave a little bit and climb a little bit. Could the thermal be big enough that where he's turning on the outside edge where the lift isn't strong enough and as they left, they actually entered the core mm. and he's just missing the core? Yeah, to me it sounds like that, that's most likely exactly what happened. Yeah, yeah. And I bet they would have probably left upwind. Yeah, yeah. Right? If it was from Tiger, I bet it was towards Issaquah. Right, somewhere, right? right? Yeah. Or Northridge, so somewhere like that. Yeah. And um, but this guy, another pilot, when they left, uh, they left. They're not turning. They're kind of go very long in a straight line, and then make a ninety degree turn, right? So, so these are the, the things, and then they're still climbing. So there's also right there's columns of lift, and there's lines of lift. Yeah, yeah. Right, and um, lines of lift are not unusual. Convergences are typically like kind of more lined or rectangular form, or however you want to put it. Right. Um, so we tend to think of lift as always these columns, mm -hmm. but plenty, plenty of times uh, I've been flying and you're going up in a straight line, yeah. but then you turn and oh, I'm not going up over here, and oh, I'm going up a little bit, I'm not going up over here, and then you find the line and you go in a straight line again, you can go up for two minutes, yeah. right? And so what's the right way to fly that, that, that thing? It's in a rectangle, right? You go over here, you turn, you go over here, you turn, you, turn, you know? It's not a column, you don't do circles in it. Um, and like often we have that convergence, that, that, that convergence that we see a bunch in the clouds that goes from here, usually, usually it's on this side of Lake Sammamish, and it kind of, it goes on the high ground past Ishikar Highlands for, for ages, right? That, that convergence line is like, man, I've been, just the other night was motoring under that, over, under that for like, I don't know, 10 miles, right? With no turns, staying at cloud base the whole time at like, Whatever, six thirty at night on a day it rained all day. You know, yeah. it, was, it was a good day, huh, Mark? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he came to take up and saw everyone up, but then it didn't. <laughs> it was a good day. Um, yeah, lucky. But you did ten miles on that street? I went to the other side of Lake Sammamish. Wow. Yeah. wow. Yeah, and I, I think at one point I didn't turn for ten miles. Yeah, for a long, just under couch. Right. Really nice. You know, and speed when I wasn't going up, and then coming off the speed when I was, and it was good. Going yeah. up most of the time. Yeah. Do you have any indicators on the clouds that look different for those convergences? Yeah. yeah. So, there's a lot to talk about with indicators of clouds. Um, first of all, a convergence. Are we doing okay on time, Mark? Are we, are we all good? Yeah. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'll give you like a cross section, right? These yeah. are the two air masses, right? Yeah. Usually, what's causing a convergence is two air masses and one is denser than the other yeah. right so like you know think cold air is one way to say dense right cold air on this side um it might be coming off the sound yeah. right cold water over there um cold air on this side warmer air less dense air on this side humidity content can also cause that difference in density humid air is less dense the non-human air, weird how someone feel like that skin yeah but hydrogen is the lightest element so h2o Hydrogen is the lightest on the periodic table, at least. So um, humid air is less dense than non humid air. So hot, humid days, we have the fastest takeoff landing speeds, right? Because it's the least dense air is hot and humid. So anyway, it's like this, right? So when, when you see this big, fat cloud street, expect like a long cloud street, there may be one side of it that's in growth and one side of it that's in decay, mm, right? Okay. And the growth side is gonna typically look very kind of like white and clean to the eyes, right? It's gonna have very defined edges. Mm -hmm. So like it's gonna be very obvious like, ooh, that's thick cloud. That's 
open air, right? Really defined edges. And um, the bottom of the growth side will usually either be flat or possibly kind of concave. Concave, probably air is rising right into there, right? And then the decay side is usually is like a little grayer, not quite as like stark white, right? And have has more, um, not as defined edges, right? It, it could be like, okay, there's this area here where it goes from sky to thick cloud, but it's an area more than just a line. Does that make sense? Um, and the bottom of it won't be quite so organized either. The bottom of it will typically kind of be more jumbly and like look like there's falling out and coming up and all that stuff. So if I'm looking at a cloud stream and I see those differences, I'm going to be on, on the rise narrow side. Now, if it's not a convergence line cloud street, right, if, it, if, if there's just a wind going this way, typically, which side do you think is the upwind side? Say that again. Sorry. Where, so if I'm looking at a cloud, yeah. wind's coming from, from the left, that side of the room to that side of the room, right? I'm looking at this cloud. Um, which, which side do you think would look like the growth side? The left side would be more white. Yeah, the upwind side, right? Yeah, because of all those things we talked about, right? Usually that's the strongest side of the thermal. So if, if, you're, if you're going crosswind, typically the upwind side of the cloud is the better side of the cloud. And typically you'll, you'll kind of see that also. Next time we're here kind of looking at the clouds at Lake Sammamish, you know, actually look, Squawk is kind of the better look, especially if it's north wind, which it is a lot. Um, look at the cloud at Squawk and see if the north side of the cloud looks different than the south side of the cloud. Okay? And in general, like, if you have some time to lie on your back in a grassy field and stare up at the clouds, and we probably all do a takeoff here and there, um, <laughs> look at how the clouds are forming, right? And you can kind of see the side that's growing and the side that's decaying, right? And just get an idea for like the, the length of time of clouds around and stuff. It, it, it blows me away sometimes those variabilities of like, some days each cloud will last 10 minutes if you're lucky, right? And then some days clouds will last hours and hours and hours and hours. And of course it has to do with moisture content and dew point and all these different things. But there are some days where like, if someone's in a thermal in front of you, you might get there and there's not a thermal, right? And then there are some days where the thermals just have this ability to, to stay for a really long time. Especially those winter days when the sun angle is really low, it seems like the changes are just happening faster because the day, you know, there's only this much day anyway for the whole day, the whole sun angles to progress through. Um, yeah. I was thinking, just to get everyone off their feet, let's do a little demo. Let's get in groups of three-ish and do a little demo of that group thermaling. So find enough room to walk around in a circle. And then I want, like, one person's going to say, I'm rising more than everyone. And you're going to follow the streamer. And then one person's going to say, I'm sinking more than everyone. And you're going to follow their ass. And we're going to adjust the thermal a little bit. All right, let's do it. Come on. You could everyone take them out just outside if you want to see the sky and have oh, a little more space. Oh, let's go outside and do it. Yeah. It's really, the core is you're sparring opponents together and you just want to keep circling around but giving them pressure at the same time. And that's all you want to do. It's control with the scoop in the back of the glider, right? And the drag it causes. The cool thing about speed bar pitch control with your leg is it does not add that scoop. Right? It gives you pitch control, but it's a pitch control through like a pretty uniform angle of attack change not through this scoop in the back of the glider. Does that make sense? Yeah. Cool. Now the caveats with speed bar. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> yeah. Well, who's heard that speed bar uh, makes you more prone to collapse? Has anyone heard that? Yeah. Yeah, so I, I, I'd go more with this, this school of thought. And by the way, Good pilots, good instructors, long-time instructors could have discussions on this, right? So your guys' job with anything I'm saying, anything you ever hear from any paragliding pilot or instructor or whatever, is to be thoughtful humans for yourself, right? And research things, feel things out, talk to multiple, multiple experts, and come up with your own conclusions. So my thought on it is when we're on speed bar, it's not as if more wind is hitting the, the, the top surfaces of our glider. For sure, when we add speed bar, we're asking the glider to go forward a little bit. So if we were to add speed bar at the same time we're falling out of a thermal, glider wants to pitch forward anyway, the combination of those two things could bring us closer to collapse than if we hadn't added the speed bar. Does that make sense? So this adding is a moment where like you do this at the wrong time, 
and you could put yourself closer to collapse, right? Once we're on speed bar, hey, the relative airflow on the glider is like this, right? It's just that the glider's facing down a little more, and there's more loading on the front of the glider. The, the force we feel on our leg when we're pressing speed bar is literally adding weight to the leading edge, right? We're, we're pushing the A down. That, that's the weight we've added to the leading edge of the glider. So that leading edge of the glider is more loaded, so in my view, it certainly feels like it's more resistance to folding in, just because it's more structured. Does that make sense? Cool. Um, what's not disagree disagreeable, right? So that, that, that last point I went over that we talked about is some people would disagree, right? I'm happy for you guys to come up with your own conclusions there. What's not disagreeable is that if you do have a collapse on speed bar, it's more exciting than not on speed bar, right? Because you're going faster. It's kind of like if you walk into a wall versus drive your car into a wall at 20 miles an hour. Two different things, right? Walking into a wall, oh, oh that hurt. Right? Drive your car into a wall at 20, you might be hurt. Right? <laughs> so the more speed you add, the more energy there is. Therefore, if half the glider folds like this, the more resulting kick there's going to be. Does that make sense? Cool. So I don't think anyone's going to disagree on that. Um, we, why do you guys think we might want to use speed bar? Yeah, exactly. So if I see, that's a really good instance. If I see someone low climbing pretty fast, remember, I want to end up on top of them or at their le level, right? If they're upwind of me and I just go at trim speed towards them, I might end up down here where it's pretty hard to use that evidence, right? So if I've got a sure sign of a strong thermal in front of me, it makes sense to sacrifice a little altitude for that time I'm going to spend in the strong thermal. Does that make sense? So, yeah, if I'm sure I'm going to get into a strong thermal in front of me, it makes sense to get there faster, right? If I'm not sure on it, then I'm just worried about getting there high. Makes sense, right? Cool. What else? Get through sync. Get through sync. Awesome. Right? Really good point. So if I'm, if I'm at, a, whatever, 5,000 feet, right, right below the Class B airspace, at Tiger, gliding towards Ishqua Highlands, right? It's this long glide, right? Maybe it's going to take seven, ten minutes or something, right? It's going to take a while, right? There's going to be periods on this glider, I'm pretty sure there are, that I'm in positive air, I'm in lift, and there's going to be periods I'm in negative air, I'm in sink, right? If I go slower through the lift and faster through the sink, I've spent more of that ten minutes in lift than I have in sink, and I'll arrive higher. Does that make sense? Now, actually, if I knew that whole glide was going to be sink, at the same rate, adding speed bar would give me a worse glide through that sink, a higher sink rate, and I wouldn't go as far, right? But we, we never know the whole glide's gonna be sink, and usually we're assuming it's not, right? It's, it's the and differences. And that changes with it's the headwind too, right? What's that? That changes with the headwind too, right? Boom, that was the next one to talk about, right? So when what, might we use speed bar? The headwind. If, in a headwind, oh. exactly, right? The classic example there is if this is the glider, if I have 20 miles an hour of headwind, right, and my trim speed's 20 miles an hour, if I just fly at trim speed, where am I landing? Glide is zero. I'm landing right there, right? <laughs> Eventually, I'm going to make the ground right there, whether I'm 10,000 feet high or 1,000 feet high. I'm not going forward, right? Any amount of speed bar I put on, that's my glide ratio, right? Any amount of speed bar I put on is going to bring that glide ratio up in the, tw in the trim speed wind example. Does that make sense? Cool. Now, in five miles an hour of wind on most of our gliders, maybe it's like a quarter or a third speed bar is about right, you know, to give us that ultimate glide ratio into the wind, to get us the furthest over the ground into the wind, right? Um, most barrios can tell you your glide over ground. Yeah, exactly. Which is yeah. a really cool way to, like, optimize your feeling of how much speed bar to use and how much wind. Exactly. Yeah, so any GPS instrument, um, GPS yeah. flight so instrument will give the... you a glide over ground. Our phones can do it, too. The, the glide over ground you get on your phone with like just the GPS in the phone is as accurate as a flight instrument glide over ground because that, that's only a GPS thing. It's not using barometric pressure. It's not using G-force. It's not using any of that. It's just GPS. Yeah, what's the, of your rule of thumb, right? The glide ratio is lower than 5, then you apply uh, brake. Higher than 10, then you off the, the speed bar. I mean, so this is, this is a great point. We, we can pick a most efficient glide ratio Right? And quick caveat, right? We said collapses are going to be more excited. 
So if you're using speed and turbulent air, where do you want to be? What's that? A third of it to the half. Well, you don't want to be full speed bar in turbulent air necessarily. More high. More high. 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 We don't want oh. the ground to be nearby, right? Yeah, yeah. And yes. Yeah. Wasn't right. sure you're talking for collapse. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I, I didn't answer the question great. I didn't ask the question great, but if we're using speed bar and turbulent air, be high. Right? Like I said, with the thermaline, we don't want to be within 300, 400 feet oh, of the ground thermaline. And if I'm in rowdy air, I don't want to be even 400 feet from the ridge on full speed and rowdy air. It's just like, right? Even if I'm not very likely to have a collapse, if I do, there's there's going to be a lot of action, right? If I'm 3,000 feet over the ground, no big deal. If I'm 100 feet over the ground, it could be a big deal. It could be a tree, tree land. Right? So, um, yeah, nice and high. Where was I before that caveat? Uh, glide ratio over ground. Sweet. So glide ratio over ground. Glide ratio is going to be an interaction of the positive or negative air we're in, lift or sink, and headwind or tailwind. So tailwind, high glide ratio, lift, high glide ratio, headwind, low glide ratio, sink, low glide ratio. Does that make sense? Um, so a, a way to simplify this wind to push speed bar for efficiency sake is to look at glide ratio, right? On a on an ENC, let's say like on a on a um, Bonanza, right? On an ENC glider, anything less than six and a half to one usually means full speed bar. Maybe six to one. Full speed bar is usually the right setting, six. right? Right. If at trim speed you're going six to one, full speed is probably the right setting. That's on an ENC. On an ENB. Maybe it's five and a half or five, right? On like a pretty decent performing B. Um, then for half speed, it's probably like anything less than eight on that bonanza on like a pretty good performance C. Of course, right? you put on bar and you, your glide slope gets worse. <laughs> well, here's the thing. If sync is the problem, our glide slope is going to get worse when we put on bar. Remember? Because we're just thinking I need to get out of this fast, right? If headwind is the problem, no, our, our glide slope will get better. And often, it's not just one or the other. Right? Often, these things are intermingling. So that's where the math gets a little tricky. And why, like, the, the glide slope thing is a useful simplification, but it's, it's not perfect, right? If just looking at the glide slope, because we don't actually know if we're dealing with lift or sink. Whereas if you, if you look at your, your Vario, and if you have an idea of the wing component, ground speed, you have an idea of if you're dealing with lift or sink or if you're dealing with, if you're dealing with wind. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So the pilots who are kind of thinking, looking at the vario and ground speed and have an idea of wind and lift and sink are, and, and using that for speed to fly might be just a little bit better than this, this um, glide slope speed to fly, but sure is simpler just to look at a glide slope and have a setting, right? And it works, it works pretty well. Does that answer your question a little? Yeah, yeah, I think yeah. so, yeah. Okay, let, let me go a little bit deeper, if it's okay. I was thinking about McCready's rule. Is this uh, talking about the same thing? Let me go deeper into this, and then if we have time, hit speed to fly a little harder. Because speed to, we could have an hour and a half, two hour discussion on speed to fly. So, um, yeah. Um, so we talked about pitch control and speed bar. We talked about all the caveats of speed bar. We talked about when we might want to use it. Um, let's, let's talk about how to deal with turbulence with speed bar, right? It might be bending your leg. It might be rear risers, right? Different gliders work a little bit better or worse with rear risers. So there's some gliders that like on speed, you just don't have much C tension and therefore you're just feeling a lot of slack when you're using them. And then there's some gliders that, um, I don't get you on if you're back there. <laughs> there's some Um, I didn't bring the glider out here, but you can imagine pulling the C's and using speed bar pitch control. Speed bar pitch control is still slightly more efficient than pulling C's because it's not a scoop, but pulling C's is still deforming the profile a little more than this. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So I think in general, bending the legs a touch more efficient, but sure is more of a workout and harder to do than this, right? So cho choose what you want to do. Um, I do, I do some of both. I do this some and this some. The nice thing about a two-liner is this is pretty much the same as this. 
right, on a two liner because you only have two points to pivot off each other. Um, so if, if I'm flying along and my glider starts to pitch forward, what am I going to do? Let off. Is the grass too wet to sit down? We could all sit down and try it. It's kind of wet now. pitches forward before the thermal, I bend my leg a little bit. This also might be pull the rears a little bit, depending on your preference, right? Bend my leg a little bit, glider hits the edge of that thermal, it wants to pitch back. I have a bent leg, boom! I can punch it right into the edge of the thermal, not let it pitch back, keep it overhead. Does that make sense, right? If I have my next foot ready on the next step, if I need that next step, boom, I can even do that, right? Keep that thermal, keep that glider overhead as opposed to getting pitched back by the, by the thermal. Once again, if we're hitting it from the side, the thermal wants to throw us out, right? It wants to pitch the side up and put us over here. So if I, boom, do that, punch into the side of the thing, it doesn't throw me out. I have authority over that entry. Does that make sense, right? Please then I'm coming into the thermal on speed. Be just before I feel it's time <laughs> to turn, I'll ease off the speed. Hey, what happens in still air if we come off speed? Yeah, we go up a little bit, right? It's like a flare. We convert speed to lift, right? At least we change our sink rate. So I mean, if, if it's enough speed bar, we, we go up some. So guess what? Now I've converted that speed that I put on in a headwind and sink, right? I did the conversion on the other side in a headwind and sink back there. Now I do this conversion. The, the place where I get to convert speed into altitude within a thermal, good place to do that, right? And, you know, I, I, I like, I, 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 I go up, right? I go up really nice, because I've converted speed to lift. You, I like to do it to keep my glider perfectly overhead, so it's pretty smooth, but in competitions, there's some very good pilots. Some of the best pilots in the world do, not all of them, but some of them do huge movements where they let the glider really pitch back. And you know why? Because as it's coming back forward, you can put in weight shift and put in your turn and you get that forward energy, boom, to put you in a bank and put that turn in really nice. I do it sometimes. I do do that sometimes. I do that sometimes. <laughs> does, does that make sense? And that pilot who used speed bar to get into that thermal will be like two or 300 feet higher than the other pilot. And the other pilot won't get into some of the thermals. The brake only pilot just won't get into some of them. Does that make sense? Also, remember what we said about this side of the thermal, the downwind side of the thermal, right? It's a losing battle the lower we get. So the faster we can cross that threshold, the higher we're going to be in that thermal. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. So I'm, once again, I'm not saying like, hey, if you've never practiced speed bar pitch control, next time you're in the middle of the day at Tiger with banging thermals, just start driving into every thermal on full speed. That's not what I'm saying, right? <laughs> Build up to this. We all know how to get pitch going in our glider, right? If, if, if you're in still air and you just want the glider to get pitched around, what do you do? Hopefully the brakes. Yeah, totally. So we could, we could get some pitch going with brakes, nice and high, right? With no one underneath you. Probably a good place to throw the reserve. Not that you're going to, but you don't want lots of power lines and buildings and roads down there and stuff, right? Nice fluffy trees are a good place to do it, right? And get some pitch going. It doesn't have to be huge. Actually start pretty small. Get some pitch going. Have your heel ready on that speed bar. And right here, whew, just keep it overhead. Don't let it pitch back. Does that make sense? Just get used to that time yeah. right there. And then on speed bar, you can do the same thing, right? Once again, building blocks small, right? Starting it small. Pull some rears, let it go forward. Pull some rears, let it go forward. Pull some rears, as it wants to go forward, whew, keep it overhead. Make sense? Right? I actually, I have a video all edited that I haven't posted on YouTube yet about like all these different speed bar drills and uh, how to work on the speed bar pitch control drills, which I will post any day and then um, it'll be shared on the shenanigans group. Shenanigan? Gang. Shenanigan. Gang. Cool. <laughs> yeah, you guys are. Um, I got helmet stickers for me. So. Yeah, I thought you had to earn those. <laughs> earned it. Earned it. <laughs> so if you guys are down for a little more time, I'll talk about exiting thermals on speed. Okay? okay. Cool. Once again, building blocks, right? It's good things to think about. These are really good things to visualize. 
let's touch on visualizations for a second. I'm sure I'm repeating stuff you guys know. But um, when we're visualizing, right, you, it doesn't matter like seeing things in your mind's eye and actual like seeing the mountain and the glass, that stuff's all good and fine. But what you're trying to do is feel the feelings through your body. So try to feel what the harness is feeling like when you're trying to turn in a thermal. Try to feel the brake pressure through your hands, right? That's actually creating faster connections through your digits, you know, to your brain. It's creating faster electronic connections from your muscles to your brain when you're visualizing, like trying to work on feelings. Does that make sense? So try to put yourself in the harness. Like if, you, if you're visualizing ground handling, try to actually feel that pressure on the A's and the pressure through your harness as you walk towards it, you know, all that stuff. You're trying to feel it. Seeing things in your mind eye might be helpful, but really um, making faster electronic connections is what we're after. Cool. Um, there's all sorts of tests about visualization. It's huge. You guys have probably heard the one. I'm going to butcher it. But um, across like tons of colleges in the U.S. maybe 10 years ago, they did this study where they, um, they took a group of college students and obviously they tricked them into what was being tested like they usually do. And um, three groups, right? So one group threw basketball free throws for a half hour every day or five days a week. One group threw free throws, I'm gonna butcher the numbers, but for like 15 minutes and then did 10 minutes of guided visualization. So less total time and well less time with the basketball in their hand, right? And the third group wasn't supposed to think about basketball or touch a basketball and they did all this for a month, right? At the end of the month, which group do you think had improved their free, free, free throws the most? Visualizing group. The visualizing group. Less total practice and quite a bit of it without a basketball in their hand. Right? Right? And obviously the group that improved the least was the people who didn't think about basketball. So <laughs> and it was it was it was significant, what they'd call statistically significant, right? And there's been a bunch of different studies on different things. It's not just basketball, but there's been a number of studies. It's it's a very like well founded thing to add in visualization to any practice. And it's this visualization I'm talking about, actually trying to feel it through your muscles, right? That visualization to any practice will improve our practice. I'm learning how to fly planes and everyone's talking about chair flying all the time, right? I'm spending tons of time just sitting in a chair pretending I'm pushing on the throttle and aerial arms and runners and the whole thing. Um, and it helps. It helps a ton. So when we're all driving a car and leaning, when yeah. we're turning <laughs> left or leaning. Oh, right? absolutely. Yeah. I absolutely yeah. wouldn't shift in my car. We shift in the car. Okay, let's go to exiting thermals on speed. So, when it's time to exit the thermal, I probably have a pretty good idea of this the map of this thermal right i've just been mapping it for a bunch of turns right so if this is this is the circle right here nice circle guys this is the circle right here as i got to the circle i'd aim for leaving it so i was straight and level in the thermal and i was flying through the whole thermal before the edge does that kind of make sense right so i'm straight and level in the thermal whole thermal before the edge and i'm going to add speed right i'm going to add speed and as I fall out of that thermal, what usually happens when you fall out of thermal? Pitch. Yeah, the glider pitches down. So the glider wants to pitch down. Instead of pitching down, what am I going to do with my leg? Well, Bend on, right? If I'm on the rears, I'm going to pull the rears, right? I, I let off speed, keeping the glider overhead, and then it's probably going to even out. I'm going to press speed again. There might be some junk there, sucker bubbles and stuff, right? We know that's there sometimes, right? So I'm going to work through the sucker bubbles. It's going to be at the other side. The difference is the pilot on brakes falls out of that thermal, adds a bunch of brakes, slows themselves down a bunch, adds drag when they're in sink and turbulence, right? So spends way more time in that sink next to a thermal, right? And then through this kind of like junky air has to choose a time, sometime to add speed because we like to use speed when we're on glide, right? And they'll probably be a lot slower to add speed because now they're dealing with brakes on turbulent air. It's kind of hard to make the shift when the air is turbulent. It's pretty nice to make the shift when you're in the thermal and you've got it pretty well mapped out. Um, and they're going to end up way lower and not like lower and behind than that same pilot who sped through the sink and the junks. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's even a little more advanced than entering thermals on speed, I'd say, because a lot of it has to do with their mental map, right? Because once again, we don't want to add speed as we're falling out of the thermal, right? That could, that we could actually cause a collapse that way, right? Um, but it, it works pretty darn well, and you'll see a huge difference in it. And 
you, you go to a high level comp and like no one makes it into the world championships who's not doing these things. No, just everyone there is doing it. That's that's how you fly. Um, so you know it, it's maybe a high level thing, but I think it's a good thing to start thinking about. And for sure, speed bar pitch control in general, not that high level of a thing. Something you guys can start visualizing. On smooth days, if you're doing a sled ride from Tiger, if there's no lift and you're just doing a sled ride from Tiger, hey, come out, get some air under you, and do some pitch control drills with, with speed bar, right? Get it right. And if you have a 1,000 feet of air under you, or under you, hey, a collapse is no big deal. If you get it wrong, it's, <laughs> like, it's just a quick collapse, right? Hands up, let the glider recover. If you're not near the trees, all good. Make sense? Yeah, so I, I'd really encourage to start, like, start working on pitch control now. So, you know, when I was asked to do this talk, I was asked, hey, could you teach us how to get away from Tiger? Right? Which I think is a really good goal. Right? Cross country is an awesome goal. But what you really need to know to get away from Tiger is the same thing you need to know to get away from any mountain. Right? To fly cross country from any site. And it's these skills of climbing and gliding, about being efficient on your glider. Right? And Plenty of times, and it's very fun to do it, but plenty of times you can climb up and go on glide and maybe get one or two thermals and then land after an hour. Or you could fly three hours right here. And in that three hours right here, you can give yourself these drills that make you a much better cross-country pilot. Then when you do decide to go downwind, you're going to stay up longer. You're going to have a better time of it. Does that make sense? So here are a couple things to do with thermals. Take a thermal up to the top, right? Take a thermal up to the top or up to, you know, 200 feet under the class B, 500 feet under the class B, right? Um, take a thermal up. <laughs> he said I could be I up here. <laughs> they don't want us in there. That's, that's bad news. <laughs> um, go on glide. Try to be efficient on your glide, right? And come back and try to enter the thermal 500 feet lower than you started. That same thermal you're in, and try to remap it out. Right? You can imagine the the mapping practice this is going to give. Right? Because you left the thermal, you glided out. You're trying to think how much altitude am I losing? How do I get back into there about 500 feet below, and then climb up again? Right? And then do it again, but come back into the thermal a little lower. Let's say 600 feet. And every day is going to be different with altitude. Some days 100 feet's enough. Some days you might come a thousand feet lower and you might still have plenty of time to thermal, right? But like next time 600 feet, next time 700 feet, right? Then you've been leaving the upwind side, coming back into the upwind side of the thermal. Try leaving the sidewind side of the thermal, come back in sidewind side of the thermal. Then try leaving downwind, coming back in downwind. Think about how your glide ratio is different as you're pushing into the wind and interacting with that thermal in the downwind versus upwind, right? So give yourself these little drills to make flying this site and staying in the same place incredibly interesting and really good training. Does that make sense? Right? And I like how a lot of people are writing down the drills. <laughs> nice. <laughs> awesome. It's really good. Um, and then if you have two thermals, right? Sometimes there's two nice thermals marked out. Sometimes there's one like kind of off one of these points here and one on that point over there. Or it might be like here in the north ridge. Might be two thermals, right? Something like that. If you have two thermals, go between the two. Right? and try to take different paths. Okay, this time I'm gonna go way out in front between the two. Okay, that was cool. This time I'm gonna go between the two, you know, on a straight line. This time I'm gonna go a little bit downwind between the two, whatever it is, right? Give yourself these little goals. Try to, try to feel what it is to enter the thermal in different altitudes. Try to feel what it's like to say, I'm gonna to get to that thermal 500 feet lower than I left today, right? And how do you do that? How far away do you go in this wind and in this lifter sink? And how how do you come back? It's going to force you to be looking at your instrument at those altitudes, at those glide ratios, at your efficiencies, using the speed bar, right? And that's what we do for XC, right? That's really essentially what we're doing for XC. Obviously, there's like places where the, you know, we have little secrets on thermals, but plenty of times I've gone to a site I've never flown before and set the site record. So it's not like I have some sort of preconceived notion about where the thermals are on this landscape. No, it's, it's that the same things I do everywhere work. Right? right? Yeah. Basics. Exactly. The basics work. Right? It's not like 
oh, there's the secret about this like little ridge over here with, with you know, a house with a purple roof, and that's Nobody where you find no, no, it's just, you, know, you fly under a cloud, or you you, you go till you know, that, like the same basics are working in lots of places. It's more about just really, really hammering those basics. Treat it as training. And a lot of people, can we go further? Yeah. I'm kind of getting into all these little out, outpourings. But. Absolutely. <laughs> um, here's the way to treat every flying day like a training day, right? And we want to train. We want to get better because it's, it's what rewards us, right? It's what makes us happy is seeing improvements, seeing us get better. It, um, it's safety in this sport, right? To learn more about the conditions, learn more about the wind, learn more about how to handle our glider, get the thermal triggers higher, get over LZs higher, know what the wind's doing in different places. That's all safety in the sport. So if we're in a cool sport where progression is safety. I don't think speed flying is exactly the same thing, right? As, as you progress, you get closer and faster, right? <laughs> so I, we're, our sport, I really feel like progression is safety. Um, cool. So what to do on a training day? I call it the three P's of training, right? The first P is preparation. So if I'm going to fly, if I'm going to fly and I think it might be a record day, right? Let's say a huge day on the east side, Chelan or something, big record day. I'm going to spend some time in my bed at, right after I wake up or as I stretch or something in the morning or something like that, drinking my coffee, enjoying the view. I'm going to spend some time thinking about my goals for that day. And I want them to be attainable goals, right? So attainable goals for any, for any of us might be, hey, I want to be aware of wind direction during my flight today, right? And be aware of wind direction. Hey, I want to be aware of my glide ratio on glides. Be aware of glide ratio on glides, right? I want to see if there's pilots underneath me climbing today. Great small goal to have that's attainable, right? So think about the little goals. It's going to have to do with this is a cyclical three P's of training. So it's going to have to do with the last P on the day before, right? On the last day you practice. Think about that. Try to visualize that sort of stuff in bed that morning or a coffee or whatever. Try to visualize like, okay, what is it? What, what's it going to be like to be on glide, looking all around and glancing down at my glide ratio, right? Or what's it going to be like to be thermaling and occasionally scan around and see if any pilots lower than me are climbing. Whatever your low goals are, right? Try to put yourself in that place and actually perform it, right? Um, so try to visualize. So you kind of have this, this structure of the day like, hey, this is what I'm working on today. And it doesn't have to be like you're going on a big epic flight. It be, hey, I'm coming to Tiger. I'm pretty sure it's going to be a sled ride. I'm going to have the goal of speed bar pitch control, right? Something like that. Give yourself these little goals on every single flying day. So preparation. Um, the middle P is performance, right? Performance is when we're actually doing the thing, right? We're actually flying our gliders. Guess what? We're going to make mistakes and we're going to have successes for sure, right? I have never had a, mis had a flight that I've landed and could say I didn't make any mistakes. Never. Right? And I've had some pretty rad flights, but all of them, I can, I, I, I land and I say, okay, I, I could have done that differently. And I think this would have worked a little better. And I kind of... You know, there's always things to learn, always mistakes made, and there's always successes that we want to we, we, we want to acknowledge as well. But while we're in the performance, we want to be performing. We want to be in the moment doing things. One way to look at it is if we had a shitty takeoff and we're now looking for the thermal, we don't want our brain on that shitty takeoff, right? That's in the past. Once we land, the third P, it's coming up soon, don't worry. <laughs> Once we land, we can think about the shitty takeoff. But right now, I gotta think about getting to my thermal or having a good flight plan to get to the LZ at a decent altitude, right? Or figuring out what the wind's doing down here, whatever it is, right? We wanna be in the moment where we're flying. It's very important that we are, right? Same thing, if you just, if all your buddies climbed up and you screwed it up and you sunk out, you don't want to be doing your landing approach thinking, oh man, I suck so much. Why am I not at cloud base with my friends? I'd really like to be up there. No, you need to be focused on this. Right? This is life or death right here, right? Landing nicely is life or death. You got to be focused right here. Um, so performance, we're focused. We're in the moment. There's going to be mix mistakes and successes. That's the way it is, right? Then after the flight, processing, right? I start it like gather up my glider as I'm walking over to the packing area. I've already started processing, right? So I'm thinking, 
and obviously there are tons of tools for processing. One thing I really like these days is my smartphone has a voice recorder, and if, if every flight I can talk into that smartphone for even just five minutes, just talk through the flight, talk about how it was going for those little goals, what you did right, what you did wrong, what little goals you might have for the next time, right? The goals you met, the goals you didn't meet, stuff like that. Just talking to your smartphone's huge. You know, some of you might be journal entry writers, that's huge and it's cool because you can look back on them. And actually, it doesn't really matter if you, well, you benefit from journal entry or smartphone talking or talking over a beer with a buddy and being very honest about the flight, whether you look back on that recording or journal entry or not, right? It's kind of like cementing the thoughts down there, going over them, going through the process of looking back at the flight, that's, that's really important. Even if you were just lying in the sun and visualize the flight in your mind and goals, that's gonna help. So the processing is huge, right? Processing is huge. You'll come up with questions you wanna ask mentors. You'll come up with little goals next time. You'll come up with the things that you're gonna work on on the next sled ride or on the next thermal flight or on the next ridge storm flight, whatever it is, and you'll cement it. A lot of pilots come, go flying, right? They're, they're, they're like on emails on the, way to, on the way to take off. They're talking with friends. They're, they're, they're not, they're just, they go flying. If it was a good flight, they're happy and then they go to work. If it was a bad flight, they're bummed and then they go to work or go to family or go to dinner or whatever. And they don't take the time on either side, which that preparation and processing might be where the most learning's at. Does that make sense? Muscle memory we learn in the air, but the being thoughtful about our progression, about what to, what to attack in the progression next, what goals to have next, that's probably where the most learning occurs. So a lot of people, because we're in such busy lives, a lot of people miss out on that learning and literally it's just five minutes on either side is gonna do a whole lot, right? A little bit more is probably better, but five minutes on either side is gonna do a whole lot. Five minutes, six minutes. Yeah, <laughs> and you know, one thing I did say about those little goals that we all know, the reason we want all these like little goals that are attainable is because we get rewarded from achieving those little goals, right? And that's what keeps us in the game, right? We get little dopamine hits when we get reload, reloaded, uh, rewarded, reload on the dopamine. And uh, <laughs> and uh, that's what makes it fun, right? To be like, yes, I, I, was, I was better at carving a turn in a turbulent thermal today, right? Yeah, I saw that bird way over there in low that I wouldn't have seen a month ago because I figured out how to like expand my observations, whatever it is, right? Whatever little goals you're working on, when you start to see the improvement in them, you get pumped. And that's why we're in this, right? For the reward of it. Because it's really fun, right? So um, it makes it more fun, too, to have those little rewards. Yeah. Um, any questions on any of that stuff, guys? It might be a good time to break. That's kind of a nice ender. Um, unless there's any questions or things. For next it, week, do you want us to watch any of the websites or anything for preparation? Or just work on the uh, pitch control stuff that you talk about and not worry about the next session? Here's what um, here's what I'd like everyone to do for next week. Um, I'd like you to to have one flight. It could be one flight in the next week, or it could be one flight you've already done that you have a track log of. Does everyone know how to record an IGC track log? Right. We can do it with a lot of phone apps. Um, Fly Sky High on, on Apple, or like um, um, XC Soar or XC Track on Android. Right. Um, it can be with one of those. They're really easy. You just you just turn it on and fly with it, and just record a track. Um, or all of our instruments record a track. So record a track, put it up on Avery, a y v r i dot com, right, and do a write up of that track. Okay. And yeah. I don't even know how to get on Avery, so that'd be a good. A y v r i, and you'll it's it's pretty intuitive how to upload a track there. Right. Um, if it's from if if the tracks are already on your phone, it's a little easier because you don't have to plug anything into a computer. But if it's on an instrument, you have to plug the instrument into the computer, extract the IGC file, and then upload it to Avery. Um, if it's on your phone, you just find it on your phone's files. Okay. Um, do that, and that's a pretty nice processing practice in all your flights. So, do the write up and watch the Avery. Right. And um, the write up could Im include a bunch of stuff, and send the write-up and link to Avery to me. There's a lot of us here, so I can't guarantee I'll watch everyone's, but I'll try to choose a couple and, and choose one of my own 
that I'll kind of show you my processing through with. Right? So we'll do it on the screen and I'll show you like how I process a flight and think about what's showing good thermally and what's showing thermally could be improved. And it's even better if some of you guys fly together through the week or have in the past and you submit the same tracks. Right? So if, if you can say like, hey, I had that nice thermal flight with Ken, right? Ask Ken like, hey man, you remember that flight? Let's submit that track for this. Right? Because then we can look at multiple tracks on Avery and it's better. So um how do you want us to send that to you? So send me in an email, send me the Avery link, send me the IGC track file, and send me the write-up. Okay. Can we get your email right now? Yeah, it's uh, Mitch at MitchRiley.com. Yeah. Easy to remember. Yeah, totally. And in the in the um in the in the title of the email, just put like start it with shenanigans. Okay, so that I can see it come in and I easily know who it is. Shenanigan homework. Shenanigan homework, yeah, totally. And, um, yeah, guys, if you're down, I'm, I'm down with doing this kind of like for all summer and thinking of, Dude, thinking yeah. of different things to think about. I'm, once again, I'm really sorry I was late this morning. It, um, we did have quite a few on YouTube, by the way. Um, not broader YouTube, but private link. There was like 20 people that were watching while we were inside. Oh, cool! Yeah. Rad! <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, and I did take it outside. Sorry if you yeah. did. <laughs> <laughs> I had it up on the balcony. Nice. Believe it or not, I had it on the balcony, and they were actually watching and listening oh, cool. from Oh, cool. Is this there. still working? Oh, <laughs> no, they just, they were all turning the volume up, and they were, like, <laughs> <laughs> That's rad. Thanks for doing that. Appreciate it. Um, and I also, through this week, I'm going to upload that pitch control drill thing so it's basically me going through all these pitch controls I do for speed bar pitch control at like a um, at a coastal soaring site so like a nice place with smooth air that like is a good place to train um, and uh, you'll kind of see the drills I do and what I'm talking about and I, I talk through them all so I'll upload that um, this week and send it out to the game yeah I'll upload it to my YouTube and I'll either let you or Cody know when I do it so I can upload it to the gang and I, I get I, it's, it's a whatsapp group I guess I'll get on the game. What's happening? Too. We're going to have to clean it up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm a hard ass as far as that. <laughs> Not at all. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we're we're down to our level. Did I hear an F word? I'm telling my mom. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Mitch. Yeah. And once again, I apologize about the tardiness. Um, it won't happen again. So, I'll, I'll where, where's the little what's up? I I try to get lost when I go for runs. I'm jealous. Okay. I can't get lost like, anymore. I that should I work, like right? All this stuff like, I, I love getting lost about, in the woods. And I must have passed a trail or something because all of a sudden I was just in a wet forest. I have no idea where I was. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, do I turn this way? Um, I'm sorry. <clears throat>